I always knew they couldn't make the books scene by scene as written. We'd have had 12 hour long films. I do think we deliver on the spectacle, but I think we always tried to make sure there was a heartbeat beating underneath that. Because what matters most to Joe and to me is that it's emotionally true. Steve really got the books, he also got me. So this was collaborative and one of the best experiences of my life. So we met for the first time in 99? Yeah. I think? Yeah. Can you remember that? Yeah, I remember it, you know, <laughs> pretty explicitly because it was, uh, I had some nerves in meeting you because I thought, you know, that I was the yank that you thought was going to destroy your baby. Correct, and, and that's I, exactly what I thought, yeah. And I um, was very keen on, in some ways, trying to communicate that to you, and I thought the best way was, you know, to somehow have someone tell you, you know, to take a look at my previous work, and I clearly wasn't going to pander to an audience. But uh, I remember, I remember being very impressed by you. Seriously, that you. I was terrified. I cannot believe that I, I could have impressed anyone on that. Okay, I was terrified. Well, you were weirdly prescient about the movie business, which 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 shocked me. I was really wary. That's the truth of it. But meeting you was a massive relief. That's good to hear. It I wasn't. Mean, well, well, you know this. You were making me laugh. I was still. I still hadn't melted completely, though. Yeah. Well. I know, yeah. I know. And the then moment, you yeah. said to me, "You know who my favorite character is." Yeah. And I, that just was spontaneous. And I realized I don't think I'd ever acknowledged it even to myself. I remember very specifically leaning over to you and saying, "I think I need to tell you that Harry's not my favorite character." Which and, was fine. And I didn't know what you thought. I later learned that you thought that I was going to say. I thought you said, "You know who my favorite character is," and I thought, "Oh." Yeah gonna say Ron. Yeah. And I love Ron. Uh, but Ron's oh, no, so I love, I love easy them all. to love. He's so easy you to know, love. Everyone loves it. Who couldn't love Ron? And I thought, okay, you love Ron. And then okay, I said, and then you said uh, uh, Hermione. And it was true and because Hermione was melted. the character that and it stayed throughout, <sighs> um, because I think she had such this huge intelligence, but it was really a kind of exasperating, frustrating character in a way, though, that it was like the girl that bothered you in school, yeah, <laughs> but you totally. couldn't stop She's thinking about her. So, um, not always the easiest to like. Very no, but, I, but I, I liked that about her. That's um, what I liked about her. Yeah, They're, I know, but that you can see how that allayed a lot of fears, because she wasn't the most obvious character, perhaps, for a person to like, or say was their favorite character, and also for a man to like her best was arguably unusual. You've got dirt on your nose, by the way. Did you know? Just there. But the thing I liked about all the characters was that they were misfits mm. and almost no more than she. Mm. Um, and because she had no pedigree at all to be there. No. And I thought we've all, I certainly, you know, Hollywood is that way, is that there's no. I was just going to say no exactly interest, like me no, sitting at that lunch. Who would have forecast? There's no entrance exam. So you're just there and exactly. you, like you say, I'm here and I'm here to work. Um, and, no, and you were very direct. Which I, you, were, <laughs> well, which you were very respectful, but you were very direct. And I thought this is a good thing. And I thought it was going to be good for us um, because I think there are a lot of writers of books who are just happy to have a deal with Hollywood. Mm. And, and by the way, I understand, I think it was Jane Smiley or someone who just said, you have my book, now I'm leaving because I can't watch this. It was someone like that. And I think that, that that's a one way to deal with it. It is one way to deal but with it. you clearly were not going to be that way, but you also were, you were respectful of everyone, but I think you weren't just going to sit there and let someone say something foolish. People have forgotten this. There were still people talking about, could we cast an American yeah, and stuff. Yeah, definitely, and, at that point, definitely. You know, and I was violently nice. against that, and I, you were as well. That, that Ron, for some reason, was the one they thought Everyone could, thought be Ron American. could be American. Everyone thought Ron should be American. How is that thought... going to work? And I think that there was um, a feeling that Harry needed to be, to be a little more Ron-like. Yes. I remember that coming up a few times. Let's make Harry more of a wisecracker. And you said, early on, you said, Harry is our eyes onto the world. That's his function. His yeah, primary function yeah. is as the observer, which was perfect, which is exactly as it is in the books. Initially, you see the magical world through the eyes of a kid who has zero knowledge. Welcome, Harry, to Diagon Alley. So that's how you enter the... the yeah. Well, and that's how precisely how the, the scripts were in, in, in the yeah. beginning, all from Harry's point of view for for a very, very long time, exactly. And I, what I thought you had done brilliantly was balanced it. And one of the things I tried to say to people was, you know, 
Ron and Hermione are so obviously colorful, mm -hmm. interesting characters. Mm -hmm. and, and Harry's a bit of a blank slate. He is. I'm just Harry. Just Harry. Well, just Harry. Did you ever make anything happen? I think that's why different cultures were able to project onto him um, what they want him to be. And I think it's why I've always respected Dan enormously. Because he's the hardest totally, character for me to write. Totally agree. And he's is, he, the is he the hardest character for you? Was he the hardest character for you to write in terms of? No, but uh, but it's the archetype of the hero, isn't it? The hero so often is, it's like the Galahad figure, isn't yeah. it? The, the 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 guy without the quirks, the guy yeah. who simply he's the vessel. He's the vessel. Dan is the vessel. Yeah. Um, and the hardest to play by a mile. And Dan's Absolutely. just done a magnificent Absolutely. job with it. And I, you know, I'm glad to see he latterly has has got more credit for that because well, I, also I think, think he's in, done a great job. In the, in the last picture in particular, um, I mean, I think Dan's been brilliant all throughout, but he's so good in the last movie. Yeah, he's stunning. And, he, and it's honestly, Completely it's in the brilliant. silent moments. Yeah. I mean, where he's just, you so see good. on his face the, the price that he's paid exactly. for all these years. Exactly. And he's really brilliant. But to convey that was more difficult in his case. Well, I you think know, that was always something I felt you had a harder job than I did. Because inevitably, film being the visual medium it is, so much of what I could do with Harry was have an internal soliloquy. You know, I could show yes. Harry's inner musings. I could take the reader into Harry's internal space and show them around. This character whose life is maybe 80% internal, you're forced to show us that externally. So I always felt that you had a much rougher job than I did when it came to Harry the character. You're talking about trying to, to dramatize that internal life. When mm. I first started writing the script, when he was in the, um, in the cupboard, I uh, I invented oh, yeah. a spider named yeah. Alistair who we talked to, and he used to fit. He yeah. used to sort of nick broken soldiers out of the rubbish bin, yeah. and he lined them up on the shelf. And this broken army that you know that um, Dudley had thrown out. He's such a great image, the broken army. And he used to talk to them. And what, what the point was that he, he seemed slightly mad mm. when I wrote the first draft. And then when so when Hagrid appeared, you thought it was out of his imagination for a minute that he had he had summoned well, this guy. I think guy. that's a fabulous point, and that. That speaks so perfectly to the truth of the books because I've had it suggested to me more than once that Harry actually did go mad in the cupboard. And, and that everything that happened subsequently is some sort of fantasy life he developed to save himself. Well, no, and, and that's where it came from. It came from the book. I mean, because when you read the book, you, you make it pretty clear that he's an abused boy. Totally. And, I mean, and, of course he is, yeah. And so there's darkness there. And, yeah. I, th and I would go with that to a point. So that's how I wrote it. But then what happened was, you know, when I was writing it, I always dreamed about Potter. Be... I dreamt about it just the other night. Well, see, I, I was saying one of the things I miss is I haven't dreamed about it in a while. And the one thing I really, really, really miss is writing those three characters because I... Yeah, I, me too. I just I love I had it so much. Had Harry, Ron, and Hermione in all my handwritten manuscripts is HRH, which also, of course, stands for Her Royal Highness. But mm. that's a, um, and I miss just dashing off HRH, HRH. It's just I'm so many times those three characters. Well, I, know in the description, I remember thinking I always you will never trio. do that again. You I, never... I just wrote the trio. Yeah, the trio. You the trio. did. That's right. It always, always all the three. Because I didn't want you know. I felt bad always giving Harry the lead because I didn't think I thought it was more complicated than that. Mm. Because you can fall into this Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Harry, Ron, and Hermione. So I would often just say the trio. Mm -hmm. Or if I mm -hmm. felt Hermione was psychologically leading a scene in the script, I would say Hermione trailed by Ron and Harry. <laughs> and same with Ron. Ron grew much stronger in the scripts the last three movies yeah, because definitely. he. I realized him being late mature emotionally. Well, because he was he was under the under the oppression of his brother's success, yeah. and so. He, and then he has to make best friends with the most famous boy in wizarddom. <laughs> but his family and him being from a wizard family gives him an edge over both Harry Definitely. and Hermione at a certain point and his Definitely. instincts are, are, are sharper than theirs yes. so he, he became a really wonderful character to write in and Rupert's so brilliant at playing him um, I think he's so underestimated Rupert how, how, how he too. plays that character he's a genius Dad, what's that for? it's no joke I'm in love with her oh, I'm fine you're in love with her have you ever actually met her? Oh. can you introduce me? and I don't I think Rupert ever felt the slightest bit of angst. He just walked onto set, it seems to me. I mean, mate, that's true genius, isn't it? Knocked it out brilliantly, went back to his dressing room and played darts for a bit. He dramatizes it in a way that's just so human. He's so real. Totally. And then He's not knew? a clown ever, and that's what I like about ne him. Never a clown, but then it turns out he can play drama brilliantly as well. Because oh, all great. the darkness that suddenly erupted out of him was phenomenal. No, I, I love Rupert. I think he's amazing. Yeah. I'm still here. But you two carry on. Don't let me spoil the fun. We should talk about the emailing. 
because I mean that's how we worked. <laughs> well, there was some of it was time difference. You also were yeah, we were twelve hours apart. And we're writers, so it was a bit writers. like having letters back and forth, but which yeah. is faster. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was just simply, I didn't know how it would work. Looking back, uh, within the last few months, I realized that in a way, I f writing this was a bit like being Bob Woodward and All the President's Men, and, and, and instead of meeting in a garage, I would meet deep throat in cyberspace, which yeah, was you, exactly. and I'd say, and you would say, instead of follow the money, oh, you would say sort of fun, follow the character. And, and it was like that. You would say, follow the character, it'll lead yeah, you well, there. Yeah, well, for me, character is everything. No, everything. But I remember we had very, that was the emailing thing was, you know, like it was very easy to email you. And, yeah. and I once asked, I think, about Ron's uncle. I said, can you tell oh, me yeah, a little yeah. bit, because I've got to reference him in dialogue. And I got back like <laughs> five pages <laughs> about Ron's uncle, and you don't sorry, put it, none of it's in the book. That. No, it was fascinating. I thought, oh, my God. I mean, this is like, what What do you not, not know about this world? Because I, I always yeah, said the thing about Dragon's Blood. I asked you, because yeah. I thought... All writers, have, all writers have done this and say, you know, there's 10 uses for cooking oil. They have no idea what the 10 uses are. They just think it's a cool thing to write. So I, I email you, like, what are the uses for dragon's blood? Literally, 20 seconds later, oven cleaner. I mean, it's like all this stuff. I'm like, oh Cute my God, Rupus, you know. Yeah. You really know. Yeah. Um, so it was, what was great about that, though, for me was, it, you know, it was that, it was weird because in a weird way that confirmed whether I was going right or wrong. And it was, um, you often would say, no, you're right, you're fine. And then, but, honestly, but there was that, there, that all the, the president's video, men I, thing. You would oh, just yeah. nudge me. A Dobby I, was one of the big ones, but. Yes. Yeah, Dobby. Now you like Dobby, don't you? No, I mean, what happened with Dobby, no, it was quite the opposite. That was, an, that was an example where, I don't want to get off the email thing, but that was an example where the films affected me. Because, and I don't, I don't hold this against anybody, when I saw Dobby realized on screen the first time, I was not happy. That's interesting. And I thought, this is not good enough. It's, it looks fake. Um, I said, so when he came back, Mm -hmm. For Goblet, I first draft, I sort of, I you know, I put him in the shadows. I was, he was literally underneath the, the the Great Hall. I mean, you never saw him. Um, and you said, I remember you making, you know, it's all fine. Uh, <laughs> except that you, 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 Why is Dobby under a cushion? <laughs> yeah, because he's he, he might be significant. I remember you saying, you know, typical understatement. It's 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 possible he will be he will play a significant oh, yeah, part. Yeah, 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 I remember. So that, I brought yeah. him back, and then now it shows what what when the guys are given the tools, as mm. they were in the final time around, what they can do with him. And because he was, now I can't even imagine leaving Dobby out. Dobby has no master. Dobby is a free elf. And Dobby has come to save Harry Potter and his friends. But that was an example where the movies affected me. Um, but I don't know what I would have done if I had not known you were there, because I think not knowing where this thing was going to go. I cannot think of an occasion when you got it wrong, except for the what? Dumbledore. The beautiful girl. Yeah, but the odd thing about that, I will tell you, and I don't think I've ever told you this, it did not surprise me when you told me he was gay. No, and, you, you were remarkably unperturbed. But, because I thought, I never, this is me though, and this is a, this is a real defect in me, I never felt that line needed to be interpreted Insecure as romantic. Insecure writers, this is a real defect in me. <laughs> now, whoa. No, but I mean, I, that line I wrote, I thought could be a platonic line, even though it was about the color of her hair and stuff, and I understood, but you were quite right in the sense that most people would interpret it as romantic. And so it had to go. But it was, when I wrote it, I remember thinking, is this right for him? But I thought, you know, the great thing about Dumbledore was how free he was, yeah, which is that he would look at anybody in this room, male or female, and he would say, you know, that's, I like your belt buckle. <laughs> you know, he, yeah. And that's what I loved about him. And he was so much fun to write. Artists, do you mind if I take this? I do love knitting patterns. What was great about writing him was the the burden you realized that was he was carrying mm -hmm. from the beginning mm -hmm. and to be able to write that and kind of let it out in moments because he's just he's so much the sort of soul of it in a way isn't he? he right. is should i tell you to hide you hide should i tell you to run you run should i tell you to abandon me and save yourself you must do so he's the character i miss most i found him was he the hardest one to kill well i always knew that he was going then you know I so knew. you were prepared it was horrible killing him. Not, I mean, you know, as a writer, it's not the way I think a lot of non-writers think you would feel. You're very clinical when you do it, aren't you? You, you, you have to be. It's the like old chip of ice in the heart thing. You've got to get it right. You're very dispassionate. You're the director. Yeah. But then afterwards, I'll never write him again. And although I knew I would write him again in flashback and so forth, it wasn't the same. It it's funny, there's real power in that King's Cross scene, and I feel it's I also think very there good. There is, and I love it. But I stopped but in the I book hope at that you, point. Did you? Yeah, because I thought, Did Whoa. you feel how much no, it was just, lighter it was, he was? It, it was dizzying because you have one great moment, which was. I think if you so desired, 
You'll be able to board a train. And where would it take me? <laughs> on. Oh, that's so brilliant. You know, it's just like... Thank you, Steve! Well, it's all brilliant. You know, it's, you know that. But it's just... Um... What I like about that scene, and you really got it in the script, Dumbledore's lighter then, isn't he? You, you get the sense that... This is that your party. It's, 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 like exactly. That. Exactly. This is your party. He's freer. He, I mean, well, he's free. He's played his part. He knows he's done it properly. He knows he's brought Harry where he needs to go. He's free, which was very, very rarely get with Dumbledore throughout all seven books. He very rarely makes... Although, as you say, he is free about other people. No, but it's interesting you mentioned... He's intensely reserved about himself. But, very. And it's always done with humour. And, fl and flippancy if he talks about himself. Well, it's what's brilliant about the, the Al Aberford thing, which is that he says, do you really know my brother? Yeah, well... Did he ever mention me? Did he ever mention me? <laughs> exactly, know, and, and, exactly. And Harry's sort of... Yeah, now um, you mention it. Because <laughs> I actually wrote a moment in the scene with Aberford before they enter Hogwarts Castle, where Aberford keeps pushing Harry's buttons, and, and he mm -hmm. says, why do you believe my brother? Why do you believe my brother? And he says, because I have to. Well, yeah. He screams at him, he says, I have to, because if I don't, I don't know who I am. And what you realize is that in a way Dumbledore had molded him. Yeah. And so, you know, but I think everyone was sort of uncomfortable with that except me. But it's in measure of the, I think, the dimension I like of the character. I think you and I are crueler. <laughs> crueler, crueler, yes. Oh, yeah. Especially, I think, emotionally. We're very similar in that, but we tried to. We were more comfortable with. Yeah, with coldness, I suppose, a certain coldness. Yes. But some people do find that very unattractive. My own sister. You know, there were times in the in reading the novels. I remember when Hagrid goes underground after it's discovered he's a, um, and this is in the parlance of the book, not mine, a, a half breed, effectively. Yeah. And she says, to me, "Why didn't Dumbledore go down sooner? Why didn't you? Why didn't you go and see him?" And uh, I said, "Well, you know, you've got to back off. Let people learn their own lessons. Sometimes he's so detached. He's like you." Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but I think it's why it's odd. Um, I think it's why children respond so, That's and I think so. When they read these true. books, yeah. it seemed it had the more than a little whiff of reality. I think they know the world's a hard place. Children, yeah. But childhood is the reverse of warm and fuzzy. My childhood uh, wasn't yeah. warm and fuzzy. The playground is a brutal place. No one asked your opinion. You filthy little mud blood. It is Lord of the so Flies. The, the, yeah, play, the playground is Lord of the Flies. So many Potter readers I've had this conversation with. So many of them yeah. saying it gets better. It's really true. The adult, too. The adult world is it much really colder. Is true. Well, they also what people don't realize is that a lot of people, you know, I think, as you said, you know, your 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 life story became more Dickensian with each passing year. As the books became more successful, you you suddenly were, you were a streetwalker, you were a heroin addict. I mean, yeah. but the truth is, you did not have it easy, and it is a remarkable story. And you were writing them in coffee shops, and you were you know imagining them on trains, and there's. There are young people like that who are feeling, you know, that things are not going their way. Mm -hmm. And what they can do is they can sort of come out of it. And, 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 and you've proven that. I mean, and I think the characters in Potter, what always sustained to me the books was that they're really rich and they're, they feel real and the dimension of them is extraordinary. But not knowing where this thing was going to go was unnerving. At the other end, I, but, but it was, it's funny, I actually sort of enjoyed chasing the end. And I think it was easier to do because what you said earlier, which was that I always felt your primary concern is character Completely. and things like um, it's not what talents you possess, it's what you do with them. And those, those are the notes you're trying but to you strike. You got that really, really early on because uh, I remember you saying to me maybe around about the time of Azkaban, yeah, the magic's fun. You've got to strip that out of the way. The reason that people like the books is the characters. Yeah. And that's, I think that's complete. I think the best ideas for both the books and the films are, and look, the f by the way, going back to the first day we met, this was, this was the moment that stunned me. I remember you, um, you saying, you know, you said, I know the movies can't be the books. And I said, really? And you go, you go, it, cause I know what's coming. And she says, you're not going to be able to do it. Because you, <laughs> you were, you were really sort of doing Goblet of Fire at that point. Yeah. And you said, it's not going to be possible without the movies being eight hours long. And I thought it was so, again, so prescient. And I you forgot, said, I forgot I said that. And then you said something very specific. You said, look, all I ask is that you be true to the characters. Yeah, yeah. And I remember it, saying that, yeah. And yeah, I think the thing, what happened for me was, and it was not anything that you did, it's what the world did, which was that what happened was, what well, brilliant text became sacred text. And, yeah. and, and I think... Which is not an easy position to be in. No, because Alistair was gone, and, and for the most part, the broken soldiers were gone. And, and it also was because when Chris came in, and I understand Chris wanted to have great fidelity to the text, and, and, and it came out of enthusiasm. Um, 
but it was harder than to improvise. And it, I'm not saying that was the wrong decision. I'm just saying that I think by the time that Alfonso came along, we I had to. Had, yeah. We had to change a little bit because we couldn't do it. As time went on, people had more confidence. I think that, that as the series went on, though, I think that you were given a more latitude to improvise, as yeah. you say, and I think that was great for the film. Well, you would always um, encourage it, though. You well, would always I did. Said. Uh, this is the irony. Everyone always assumes I would say, don't change a yeah. word! But actually, quite the reverse, I used to say, yeah, change it. Well, I, I was saying before we started this that, to someone that, that um, either people think you were standing there like a taskmaster or that you weren't involved at all. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you, you were always I my greatest... I could have used in and out like a ghost. Well, I, I could have used you even more, but you were always just my greatest ally. I mean, if, I mean, I know perfectly well there were things that were very losable in Goblet and Phoenix if you weren't going to make the eight-hour movie. I mean, as it turns out, I said to you years previously, which I couldn't remember at all, but I, I knew that. And well, that's I, what you were thinking, because I know you were writing Goblet at the time yeah, you said to me, was, and you exactly, knew how yeah. big it got, and the scale yeah, of it, and how yeah. it widened out. And there was just no way, and how complex the story was. So I think that's when See, you know, we there, had to just make those decisions. That was something that's difficult in a novel that's easier in a film. Because that one of my hugest challenges in writing the Potter series was, you've got this, this boy who's 13 years old, who I know in four years' time has to take on the greatest art wizard of all time. Mm. He needs a phenomenal amount of information before he can do that, and he's trapped in a boarding school. Mm. So the books became broader, if you like. I know they also became longer, because I had somehow to move Harry outside that school and give him access to places and people he would not normally have come into contact with you were school. training him up. I say. had to, so yeah. I had to take him to the Quidditch World Cup. I had to take him into the Ministry of Magic. This is what bulked up those books four and five. He had to go and make some contacts and see some stuff that he, sim he couldn't plausibly do at school. Otherwise, you get the Power Rangers, where <laughs> the forces of evil attack only within a, about a square yeah. mile. Yeah. Yeah. No, so that was my about, challenge. I mean, it becomes, the world the becomes films, very big and hairy. It yeah. expands. And, it and in the novel, that was a logistical problem. In the films, it was a bit of a gift because you got Huge to do gift. these fabulous locations and you could convey so much just visually, just you in 30 seconds of well written script, you could say what it took me three pages to tell the reader. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it swings and roundabouts. And I know that we both have particularly tortuous memories of Goblet of Fire. Yeah, I mean, it was never easy in a way, but because I think what's so um, special about the books is the, the detail. And so I always sort of endeavored to put the detail. And I, when I say detail, I mean, even I always felt the small magic was often more evocative than the large. But I think when I remember when it got to Goblet of Fire, when Chris had ambitions to do all of the movies, he and I had talked at some length about Goblet of Fire being two movies. The thing is with Goblet, the things that we lost were not necessary to the central, central plot. I know there are things in both Goblet and Phoenix. I'm going to defend all of the other books to the hilt, but in both Goblet and Phoenix, there was stuff to lose. I know it. The thing that I, I slightly regretted in Goblet was um, Spew. Hermione's yeah. mad campaign to liberate the house elves, who actually didn't want to be liberated. Because I wanted to explore the fact that there was endemic injustice in that world yeah. and it gave Hermione a, a dimension that she hadn't quite had hitherto. She was this quite shrill, I think very plausible, and I speak as one who was Hermione-ish, you know, a bit of a goad, you know, a swat. But this was about something else. This was quite altruistic. She was the first one to show political awareness and then, and Ron, who has always taken this completely for granted, yeah, that's how it is, they work for us, yeah. You know, this says something about Ron, who's actually a very sympathetic character, yeah. but has always assumed that that was just... But it's great. Guy. It's a great tension. It's a great tension between the two characters. But yeah. it, where did it lead? Well, I suppose you could argue it led kind of in a convoluted way to Dobby's death. Dobby is happy to be with his friend, Harry Potter. It gives that some flavour well, because of that you. In the books. You set things up very right. early. So and they pay off three or four I books later. I wanted the reader, maybe the younger reader, to understand when Dobby chooses to die that way. Wow, you know, this, he's from an oppressed minority, many of whom wouldn't have even chosen not to do their domestic servitude. So wow, what, what a great guy Dobby was. <laughs> I feel, you know, that was so. I was. I suppose there was a lot of that in there. Goblet. The Bar, talk about Barty Crouch. Bartimius. Not trying to lure Potter into one of the Ministry's summer internships, are we? Last boy who went into the Department of Mysteries never came out! 
that story I must have spent three or four months trying to make dramatically comprehensible on screen. And so every sorry. time I did it, you know, everyone, you know. I am so sorry, Steve, because I handed you a problem that had tortured me. Because the scene at the Quidditch World Cup where you first see but don't see Barty Crouch and you don't know what's going on yeah. and the dark mark appears for yeah. the first time and it's incredibly obscure in every sense what's going on there and trying to make that appear in any way um, coherent <laughs> to the reader while obscuring as much as I needed to obscure was terrible. I, I had about 13 drafts of that, that chapter. Literally, I think I did have 13 drafts. And then instead of saying, wow, this isn't, you know, maybe this is too complex, I just said, there you go, you do it. <laughs> So sorry well, about no, that. and I felt, I mean, I think the thing I felt too was that it was really at the time uh, we had started to somewhat diverge because we had to yeah. a little bit from the text with Azkaban. Yeah. And what, what Goblet became um, was the moment where we said there is now really a movie tale and there is a book tale. The narratives are definitely reflective of one another, mm -hmm. but they are slightly different. And mm -hmm. so that's really what happened in Goblet. Yeah. Um, it was. I gotta say, I think it's remarkable you deviated as little as you did, to the to the central, important driving plot. I think you barely deviated. Yeah. Y you know what I'm saying? That central strand of DNA is very recognisable in both book and and film. It's, it's a movie, actually. I know a lot of people. It's it's their favourite, and um, I've had that over the years. That a lot of people come up and, and like that movie in particular. I think it's because much of what he, the sort of sensibility Mike brought to it. The yeah, interesting thing about Mike knows he was English. So yeah. he sort of, without even trying, I think got the school thing. I yeah, think you totally. feel that. I mean, you totally feel that in the movie. Mike nailed the Yule Ball so yeah. perfectly. I've, I've, been, I've been told that a few times. I love that. That's one of the highlights of the series for me is the ball scene. I couldn't improve it on it in any way, shape or form. I, visually, it was perfection. The performances are stunning. Um, it's pacey. Because that could have brought all of the action to a halt, couldn't it? It could, Absolutely. As, so, as we, I mean, pace is such a problem with the films I know. Because in the book, I, I frequently gather my characters together and they'll sit down and have a conversation for three hours. You don't do that. So well, you also do this thing which used to drive me truly insane, <laughs> which mean, is that a chapter would end, and then the next chapter would begin. Over the next three months, not much <laughs> happened to Harry. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, but now it's winter, or it's now it's spring, and I'm like... Oh, do a montage, come on. Well, that's right, yeah, because I hate that. I mean, I hate that thing of, oh, you see the dissolve, and like suddenly, you know, yeah, exactly. here comes the spring flowers, and, you know, because, you know, directors look at you like you're mental. But, um... We haven't mentioned David Yates. The, the two things are great about David, which is that most directors, if there's a conundrum, and on a Friday you're talking about it, he says, I'll think about it over the weekend. You think about it, let's talk on Monday. Well, most directors don't think about it at all over the weekend, <laughs> and they expect you to figure it out. Um, David Yates actually thinks about it over the weekend, and they ruin, you know, his wife's weekend thinking about it. So you come to me, I think I figured it out, and he has figured it out, and you're like, Jesus. Um, you know, this guy actually works. But, and also, he's eerily good-natured, which I, I am convinced cloaks an absolute, you know, massive hostility in some way. <laughs> he's just so nice. I mean, I've never seen okay, him not be nice. do you not think that may say more about you than about oh, him, sure it, does. <laughs> it does. But, I mean, you have he's to admit, such a nice is guy. He, he must not, be uh, evil. Is he not just too nice? <laughs> I mean, come on. He is. He's in the film he business. Is. It's not possible. He's a wonderful guy. He he's is, really he's wonderful. He's a really wonderful guy. Yes. The one thing is, and, and I will say, it is the material. Again, I'll just say that. It has attracted not only the greatest acting talents, it's attracted remarkable directors. I do think, you know, Alfonso had a great deal to do with that. I think when Alfonso agreed to do the third one, it was sort of like sending a message um, to the industry that he thought that it was worth his time, something he wanted to spend time on, mm -hmm. and um, because they are two, two and a half year enterprises, yeah. and uh, we've been very it's lucky a that big way. big deal. I mean, you, when you look at what the d director has to juggle on Potter, it's staggering. I can remember following Chris around, having a conversation, watching him running to, to test some pyrotechnic effect, running over here to check something going oh, on Oh, and Chris is set, built for that. Running back in for, to, to finesse something yeah. in the script, you know, it just, and, and the, the physical scale of everything he's expected to manage, plus a cast of, at times, 200, you know, insane. But well, all of us on the movie said, we're, we're enthusiasts. I mean, we love the material. I don't know anybody who worked, you know, in the primary group that it didn't was, love the material. I, it, no one did it for, like, a job. My God, I don't... I used to come away from Leavesden virtually every time, every time, thinking... I had an idea on a train. 
and now 250 people are excitedly showing me latex goblins and remote control giant spiders and they're just building a ministry of magic I mean it was unbelievable and I, I felt the pride I felt just that that group of people were assembled because I had an idea on a train in 1990. Can you imagine? And it's, it was phenomenal. I, I, it's and hard for me to imagine that. I mean, it must be extraordinary. Great people. What, what's remarkable about it, like there's a moment in the last film, which I think um, sort of embodies, like you were talking about all these people basically living and breathing what you did. And, and there's where the dragon breaks through the roof of Gringotts. <laughs> it pauses. It breathes in air through its nostrils yeah, because it's like a bouquet of roses thing. because it's been in this musty confinement for decades. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a small moment. That scene there are moments meant like that throughout so the series. so much to me because in the first book, when I wrote, uh, they say there are dragons guarding some of the high security vaults. And I, because I can't just write that and not think about it, I, you know, this is back in 93 or something, I'm writing this. I'm thinking, God, keeping a dragon down there, that's a winged animal, you know, that's not right. So I got my chance in Seven to do this enormous set piece scene in the book where they free, and it's it's sort of bringing, bringing to light, literally but figuratively, all the injustices in that world. Mm. That's what they're doing. Harry enters this beautiful world glittering with jewels and gold and gringots, but it hides ugly stuff. You know, it was a, it was a metaphor for yep. me. But when I wrote that scene, I'd always sort of kept my powder dry through the series in the books. I'd never gone for the massive effect, because I knew that in Seven, there were a few things I wanted to do. Obviously, there was going to be the big battle at Hogwarts. But that dragon bursting out of Gringotts was major, as was the fiend fire in the Room of Requirements. Yeah. So where suddenly you really show what magic can do. No, you you felt really it go for it. You blast apart all the rules and the regulations. It was such fun to do. So well, it wasn't directly influenced by the film, but after I'd written the dragon scene, which meant a lot to me for the reasons I've just mentioned, I then thought, God, that's going to look great. <laughs> well, no, and it was like, you know, it's one of the, actually, uh, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I thought that it was going to be the, one of the more challenging ones, specifically with, you know, the Gemino curse. <laughs> They've added the Gemino curse. Everything you touch will multiply. Yeah. And I thought, how are we going to do this? Yeah. yeah, because I really had concerns about that. And actually, it's brilliant. And it, it is. And it's it, because it's, it's... one of my favorite parts of the movie. Yeah, but, but again, you have that moment where Hermione says, That's barbaric! But I think, again, it's about the this world is cruel. Mm -hmm. And... It's as cruel as our world. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's a mirror image. Yeah. Yeah. And just as they can solve things that we can't solve, so they can create problems that we don't have. And that's, that's, that's always been the, the problem for Harry, that he enters this world and, and believes it will be an escape. And it's not. Human nature is human nature, whether or not you can use a wand. Yeah. So we've talked about cutting, but speaking about something that I never wrote, but I thought was perfect, and I loved, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah, the dance. The dance. Yeah, I mean, the dance was funny because I had the idea for it while I was writing Half-Blood Prince. Um, I was driving home one day after working on Half-Blood Prince, and, and I had this idea, cause a song came on the radio, and I thought, wow, what if, you know, the radio becomes identified with Ron in Hallows. It's his way of trying to check on his family. Mm -hmm. And what if when he leaves, the radio's left behind, becomes a surrogate for him, and Harry, trying to emotionally reel Hermione back in, what if he, he stumbles on a, a muggle station, and they both grew up as muggles, exactly. and he plays the song. But it's one thing to write that, and to write the levels of it, which I'm not going to lay out, but they're very complicated. And there's nothing to play it. And one of the things I'll never forget the first time I saw it, when I saw it in New York, you could hear a pin drop, because people were scared about where it was going. And that was its intention. And that's really Emma and Dan. Oh, they communicated, it. and then they, they the all the levels. But the idea was yours, and I loved it so much. And you and I, who are violent, violently allergic to sentimentality in any yeah. form. Yeah. And what I loved about that scene was it, everything you've just said. It's just on the edge of where is this going to topple over into? Oh my God, they're not going to kiss, are they? Are they? Are they? Are they? So I'm feeling incredibly uncomfortable, borderline embarrassed, very, very moved. It's just perfect. I loved it as an idea. And you and I had a conversation where, by email, actually. I always assume we actually had the conversation, but I'm sure it was email. It was always here. Yeah, <laughs> but we were talking. And you said, 
that when they were in the tent together, you thought something was going to happen. Yeah, I did. As when you I read, read the, the book. novel, and I, as I was writing it, yeah. felt a real pull between. I remember them. you saying uh, that. Yeah, that really, I, in a sense, gave me the license to do the scene. Yeah, because I knew that emotionally yeah, it, it was true. Then. True to the character. Why wouldn't it happen? You're alone. You might die any day. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that's been holding you to, I mean, Ron has always been the, the necessary component there and he's gone. He's gone. And why wouldn't you look for comfort? I think it's more likely than not, except that then Ron's got to come back and they've got to, they've got to look him in the eye and I didn't need that emotional package well, on and top I think of everything yeah. else that was And I think it's on. a measure of each Harry and Hermione's love for Ron that it doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and I think also that it w it's one of those things that had something happen, it would have been very weird the next day. Very weird and the next day in a two-man tent. Yeah. And nowhere to run. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was, that was, it, but I think what was interesting about it was that I thought I would get real pushback on that scene. You well, know, the I would have defended you to the hilt on that because I thought it was perfect. But it was embraced. And, and yeah, mo right. no more than, it was most enthusiastically embraced by um, Emma and Dan. Yeah. And so it was, that told me that it worked and it was because it was emotionally true to what you had written. And I think that if you follow it thematically and, and you're true to the characters, you know, it's hard to go wrong if, if you're true to them, even if say the incident is not identical to what was in the book. But I want to ask you, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but was it, did in any way, when the movie started to appear, mm -hmm. did it affect your writing? At all? I mean, was there in any way? Were you able to kind of put blinders on and, totally and not? Put blinders on. I think I had such deep roots with the characters by then. Ninety nine. I, I I I was nine years in by the time we met. Right. So nothing was going to shake that. The only person who ever, well, actually you did, because I don't know whether you'll remember this, but I was writing Goblet. And I, I remember, emailed yeah, you. We were emailing a lot. During a that lot period, during that. Because you had a, a slight crisis. Yeah. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> you, you... Oh, I, no, I'm just smiling at slight. Because <laughs> you're a hard street day. <laughs> yeah, and... that, that wasn't such a good time for me. I was having a big crisis. And I remember um, emailing you and saying, I've got all this backstory on Hagrid. It's too much. It's going to be such a long book. Do I yeah, put it in? I remember this. And you said, put it in. Yeah. So can't, I put it in. Can't be enough, Hagrid. Yeah, that's what you said. Can never be too oh, much you Hagrid. can't tell me too much about Hagrid. Put it in. So yeah. I put it in. Um, that, so yeah, you had a very direct effect there. Um, but with this, the only exception, actor-wise, to my sort of didn't intrude rule was Ivana Lynch, yeah. who plays Luna, and I hear her voice when I write Luna. Hello, Harry. Luna, how do you know where I was? Experts. Your head's full of them. And I even put um, painted pictures on the ceiling of the, the uh, literary Luna's room in tribute to Ivana because she, the actress herself, is so creative, she's so talented, and I know her well. Yeah, that influenced the real. So had, she influenced the real Luna. But but you had written, the, you had created the character before you ever. Had, oh yeah, because she I ever contacted met you and she says, "I'm yeah, like this person." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you yeah, probably Ivana, thought initially. Well, of course. she was she was a sweetheart. We this the strangest thing. She, this this girl's writing to me saying, "I am, I am Luna." And she was writing these lovely letters, and I was writing back saying, well, you certainly seem to be a lot like Luna, you know. Didn't know anything about her. Then they have this open call. They, they audition. How many was it? I mean, uh, 10,000 girls. Yeah, literally, I think it was something like 12,000 people. It was people. extraordinary. Yeah. And then I walk into my office, and my PA says, they found Luna. I said, thank Christ, that was getting How down to the wire. And she said, her name's Ivana Lynch. And I nearly You've been passed corresponding with out. I said, Ivana Lynch, that's the, that's the girl who's been writing to me. So, yeah. So she was spot on, completely spot on. But that's the kind of thing that happened in Potter a bit, I think. Yeah, it did. It, it, was... it all got a little weird at times, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> but is there anybody else in there, in, in the books, that you feel where, you, you know, you, you yourself most well, comes think, into evidence? Do you, they, the great truism is that you are every one of your characters, yeah. isn't it? And I think that's true of me. And that doesn't make me, um, you know, multiple personalities. Just you have to feel every single so that character. The Voldemort side is a little scary. Yeah, I hide that well, but, you know... <laughs> I think um, I think about death and dying every single day of my life, mm. and um, I've never written anything, including the stuff post Potter, that hasn't been hugely about death. So I think all the themes are things that just preoccupy me as a as a human being. All of Did you always think about death and dying when even when you were very very young? Um, do you know what I think? Even before my mother died. Um, when I was relatively young, I was in my mid-twenties, I think I did think about it quite a lot. I can remember, as, even as a child, thinking about it a lot. So I'm... 
I was born that way, apparently. And what about you? No, I mean, someone said I came out of the womb melancholy. <laughs> You know, I said, like that about you. They said, you know, that I looked at him like I, I expected this. Once you know, I got slapped in the ass, <laughs> you know, I figured that was coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's what you said. I mean, I, I, I identify with all the characters, and I think it's why I so loved your books. You're unusually good at writing women. Yeah, I would like that. On re you are unusually well, good. Very unusually good. Because most heterosexual men, male writers, in my experience, are not terrible. Good I mean, I think it helps to like women, and and well, I. They're not I, very good I, at writing women as people. Yeah, they're awfully good well, as, yeah. at writing women as manifestations of their own desire. Well, I think there's a dearth, a dearth of that in Hollywood, right, and has been for years, and mm. continues, which is that, you know, humor is an absence often, even among our best directors, and and you know, compelling female characters, and I think. I had fairly compelling women in my life. I think I was lucky my mother was, you know, a powerful presence in my life, and I knew her value, and she's the one who introduced me to books. She just she was she was complicated, rich character, though very gentle, and um, so I like writing women. It's my, probably my favorite thing. I mean, I really I really love writing women. I like I, I love writing Luna. I love writing. You do love Luna. Oh, I love Luna. I mean, I just I, I love writing for her just because I love that that it's the most brilliant sensibility to me, which is just that. Come, Daddy. Harry doesn't want to talk to us right now. He's just too polite to say so. <laughs> and I just know, you know, it just, it's just it's who she is, you know? Yeah, she, yeah. She says something that's sort of you rude, but so her. nicely. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, you're like, okay, you know, how can you not respond to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. How is it for you the first time you see the movies? Is it is it strange? Is it is it? Um, I feel incredibly apprehensive always. Um, I think 90% of feeling apprehensive is because I have to go back and look at my work as well. Do you, can you understand that? So, yeah, see, and I you really are going to... back because you're yeah. so far beyond. Yeah, you were exactly. always so far beyond what, where so, we were. That's weird. Um, I always trust you guys. I'm always sure you've done a good job. But I'm... I don't know. I've, excite, huge excitement, but always laced with apprehension. And then... I have to say the last two, particularly, I mean all of them, I've walked out very happy, but the last two, I was ecstatic, I've been ecstatic. Did it ever become a burden in a way, the whole thing, I mean, did you ever feel, did you ever long for sort of being back in the coffee shop? I am, no. Yeah, but you can't sit in the coffee shop anymore. No, I can't, really. um, No, but I mean anybody who creates longs for, I think, an audience, and what's happened to you, I think they're lying yeah, well, if they that don't. Two, there's that two-way pull as a writer, isn't yeah. there? You, you, you want people to read it, but I think it's almost a necessary condition of writing that you have a degree of anonymity. Yeah. So that has been strange. I mean, because I, I, I it's know... It's the reason I haven't published. Um, you know, it's been a very deliberate decision. It's not there's nothing to publish. It's just I that guess. I want to I guess. let some things settle before I take any decisions on doing that. It's, and that's been great. So in it, so I, in in the most important sense, I've got it back now because I uh, only I know the characters that I'm working with now then it's my private kingdom again. I, I reclaim that. But I'm never going to lament the fact that so many people got to go to Hogwarts, you know? It's, it was wonderful. I see it as a liberating thing more than I see it as a confining thing. I mean, I'm constantly told, well, you'll, you know, I mean, you must be such a burden. You, you, you'll never write anything that popular again. I, no, of course I won't. Of course I won't. I, I'm there way ahead of you. I knew that back in Azkaban. Of course I won't. But. I see that as liberating. Harry Potter set me free. You know, I can afford in every sense, including the material, now to do what the hell I like. And if the next book I write pleases three people, so be it. That's okay. No, it's what a writer really wants to do what they do. And I, I but you know, I, I was I'm thinking, a lucky, I'm the, a very lucky person. But the magnitude of it, I was thinking, I was saying to someone, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of desperately hoping that you write, you're writing something that I can adapt, just because I, it has been really remarkable, and, and I, that rarely happens. And it was a remarkable group of people. Yeah, I have to say. God, I mean, what are the odds of it happening? I mean, that's the I thing. I know, that's so true. What were the odds? <laughs>
Harry could feel the seat vibrating beneath him. Three times should do it, I think. Ready, she said, breathlessly. What are we doing, Harry said, completely lost. Hermione turned the hourglass over three times. The dark ward dissolved. Harry had the sensation that he was flying very fast, backwards. A blur of colours and shapes rushed past him. His ears were pounding. He tried to yell but couldn't hear his own voice. And then he felt solid ground beneath his feet. And everything came into focus again.